international experts in the theory of uh, entanglement and as well as entanglement detection. And he has uh, done a large number of very prolific works on entanglement detection, including uh, multipartite entanglement, as well as experimental implementation of these proposals. And a number of his works have been very highly cited, including his uh, famous uh, reviews. So I remember reading and learning and learning a lot from his 2009 review on entanglement theory. And uh, not only that, he's been also prolific in other areas such as quantum contextuality. So today our Fried will be speaking on the quantum marginal problem. And he's recently, I mean, given a very, I mean, uh, not recently, just before the pandemic, there was this uh, PRL work on how one could detect entanglement using just a few marginals. So today I'm, I'm sure he's going to talk of this, that problem and the extensions of that work. So welcome, Otfried, and you have about 50 minutes for your talk and then some questions. So please go ahead. Yeah. OK, <clears throat> yes, thank you very much. Uh, first, thank you also for the kind introduction and for the invitation to this online workshop. Um, yes, welcome to my talk. Um, I will talk about the quantum marginal problem. And this contains several works that we have done in the last years, which can be all cast under this umbrella. And consequently, this is work um, done um, together with uh, several people, um, mostly from my group. So the first, uh, Felix Huber, um, Timo Simnacher, Nikolai Widerka, who all were PhD students in my group, but now they are in, he's, Felix is in um, Krakow, Timo is, went to industry, and Nikolai is in Düsseldorf. And there's also, I mean, work with um, Chao Nguyen, she, um, he's a um, postdoc in my group, and Xiao Dong Yu, he, he was a postdoc in my group, but now he um, got a professorship in China, and also some work done together with CNC, but he's in Bilbao. <clears throat> okay, so I think, uh, can you see my mouse pointer? Yes, we can. Yeah, sure. We can. Perfect, good. So if, if there are anything technical things um, going wrong or so, please tell, tell me yes. Sure. Fine. So, Let's start. I mean, I'm talking about the quantum marginal problem, and maybe I'll first give you some examples what I'm talking about, or just also motivate. I mean, this picture is um, maybe you saw it before. This is um, has become quite famous. It's the title of the book called Gödel Escherbach, which appeared, I think, in the 70s of the last century. And yeah, what does it show? It shows you something like um, two objects, which are actually made of wood, so it's really handcrafted wood. It's not something like a computer animation. And um, if you shine light from different angles on these objects, then you see this letters Gödel, G for Gödel, E for Escher, and B for Bach. Yeah, and this is what's the one like the nice um, title page of this book. But this already brings more or less, more or less to the main questions of my talk. I mean, you have something like a complicated object and you just see some shadows. So what can you um, conclude about the global object? If you go further, you can find such objects. And this is a funny thing, actually. Um, okay, um, you can buy it on the internet. Actually, I have here also one in my office. This is a digital sundial. So what does it look like? So this is something like such an object here. This is from a 3D printer. <clears throat> and you can buy it on the internet, so it's, it's, it's not so expensive. And if the sun shines from the proper angle, you see here something like the time in digital um, representation. And now this is, this is 120 here. Um, in principle, this changes and every 20 minutes, you see some of that this switches and the next will be um, 140 and so on. And then it always changes every, roughly every, every 20 minutes. And so this is a digital sunlight. And I mean, at first sight, you may be surprised that such a thing can be built. Yeah, because some of this is not so clear how to construct it. But in principle, this is an example of some theorem, um, which was proven in the <clears throat> 80s by some mathematician called Falconer, um, which essentially states the following. So if you have some two-dimensional shadows in a set of spatial directions, then you can always find a three-dimensional object having these shadows up to some measure zero stuff. So some, you have to follow it a little bit more precisely. But essentially, this theorem proves you that you can always construct such an object like this digital sundial. And um, yes, 
Yeah, and, and of course, it's still maybe difficult to make it, but in principle, it always exists, and you can always find such objects that exist as the design object. Okay, then coming now more in the realm of quantum mechanics, of course, quantum mechanics is not directly about shadows and. <laughs> And the sun and so on, but it's maybe about probability distributions. And in this probability distributions, we can just also ask similar questions. Yeah, consider you have something like a three-dimensional or three-variable probability distribution of x, y, and z, and you only know these marginals x, y, y, z, and x, z. Then you can ask, okay, can I reconstruct my original probability distribution from this um, marginal information? And Actually, you can be even more concrete, and this now comes more closer to quantum mechanics, because um, let's consider, for instance, four variables, um, A, B, C, D, they can have the values plus one, plus minus one, and, and let's assume that I know this marginal, this marginal distribution between A and C, which are always this red things here on the A, A D, this one, um, B, C, and B, D. Yeah, so you know this red, ellipses, these this marginal distributions you know. And now you can ask, oh, when can do these marginal distributions can come from, a, from some global distribution? And okay, this is first a mathematical, purely mathematical question, but I mean, maybe you get already intuition that this may have to do something with quantum physics because somehow this looks like some of these correlations that you measure in the bell inequalities. Yeah, you have something like A, a1, A2, B1, B2, and you measure some correlations between them. And the question is, can they um, come from some global system? And actually, that's why I'm giving you this example. <clears throat> that this was already um, proven in 1981 from Fine. This is a famous um, um, result on the CSS inequalities. That namely, actually, for these marginals, they co correspond to some global distributions if and only if they obey the, the clauser horn shimon hotel yeah, and this is now, of course, going more and more in the realm of quantum mechanics. Good. So, but now let's come even more to quantum mechanics. Namely, let's come to some um, um, quantum states. Okay. And there you can ask a bunch of um, typical um, questions. Um, because um, essentially for the quantum state, like here, this ABC, <coughs> You maybe only also only have this marginal information like this reduced density meters row AB, row BC, and row AC. And then, then you can ask, oh, what in which sense do these marginal distributions determine my global state? Okay. Or you can have also something like that in this, this example where ABCD, you have something like nearest neighbor information. You have this marginal row AB, row BC, and row CD. And you want to know, oh, what can I, what do they know to these margins tell me about the global state? And first, you can really look at some properties like entanglements that you want to detect, or whatever, some other some bell non locality, maybe from this marginal information. And actually, what I want to stress is that this also has some physical implementations in the sense that um, um, you can, it also tells you something about whether thermal states, whether the state can be a thermal state of a local Hamiltonian. I'm considering the following situation. What I have here with ABCD. In principle, if you have a Hamiltonian that only looks at row AB, I mean, it has only this term between BC and CD, which is just a typical two body Hamiltonian. Then this Hamiltonian is only sensitive to this reduced states row AB, row BC, and row CD. So if these reduced states are, um, somehow um, uniquely determine the global state, then there's also a chance that you find a Hamiltonian, which has this state as a unique um, ground state. Yeah, or the, or the other, way, other way around, it, the inclusion holds that if you essentially have a Hamiltonian um, of a, with only two body terms, then the ground state must be uniquely determined by its two body marginals, because um, the um, Hamiltonian only looks at this reduced state. And that means that if you can characterize the state as a unique ground state, it must be uniquely determined by two body marginals. 
Okay, and in principle, in this direction, I mean, there have been already a bunch of results. Yeah, and this will just give you some sort of like reduction as motivation. Yeah, for instance, there has been one old, very old paper by Higuchi and Sudbury in 2000. And um, they consider the following problem. They consider something like a bipartite pure state. Well, on it, well, first they introduce the notion of maximally entangled state, which is just a typically notion of maximally entangled states. What you say if the name is the reduced state is maximally mixed, or meaning that the Schmidt coefficients are all the same. And then you can go, for instance, for to four particles and ask, is there some state which has a property that is maximally entangled for any bipartition? And the surprising answer, what they found in, in this paper is that this you cannot find. Yeah? In principle, um, in this example, more or less, you can just prove it by a brute force calculation. Yeah, but essentially, it tells you for four qubits, you cannot have a state which is maximum entangled for any bipartition. But then, of course, the question arises can you do it for more general states, or what, how it relates to the dimension, and so on? And this is one thing that I want to talk to you um, in the following minutes. Okay, then we can look at other known results about margins, and there's a famous paper um, um, by Lindenburg, Pesco, and Hutas. Um, where they essentially show the following, that nearly every pure three qubit state is determined among all states by the reduced two body marginals. Meaning if you take something like a random state um, and somehow um, a pure state and consider the reduced density matrices, then there is only one state, pure or mixed, that is compatible with that, namely the original state which you, start, which you started um, with to um, 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 computes the margins. And okay, it's a statement about nearly all pure states. I mean, the counter examples could be the GZ state, where you can finally just see the GZ state with a plus sign, it's 0, 0, 0, plus 1, 1, 1, or 0, 0, minus 1, 1, 1. This you cannot distinguish. But essentially, these are something like the only examples, and this the, the proof for general, general state at all. And this also gives you at least hope that. The pure three qubit states can be approximated by some ground states of two body Hamiltonians. But still, the question um, remains I mean, which states can be approximated by two body thermal states? Yeah, and this is a non trivial question. But this is of practical relevance because, I mean, if you can prepare some state by some two body Hamiltonian, then it's somehow um, easy, um, or that at least there's a chance to. Um, prepare the state experimentally just by engineering the Hamiltonian and then cool it down to the ground state. Okay, and this question also has been addressed. This is just one work that I can, um, um, would you like to mention, and the other works in this direction, essentially is, um, um, stating the following, I mean, they look at certain things like graph states. Graph states are family of states which are very um, useful, for instance, measurement-based quantum computation, um, and also in quantum error correction. And it should also say that um, many known states, like the jet set state, cluster state, and so on, these are just examples of graph states. And what they proved here is that graph states, essentially, apart from trivial exa uh, examples, can never be exact ground states of two body Hamiltonians. Yeah, and also if you can approximate a ground, ground state, then the graph state by some onset of two-body Hamiltonians, then the energy gap vanishes. So um, this shows you also that this is definitely not a good way to prepare graph states by engineering a Hamiltonian and cooling it down to the ground state. Yeah. Okay, good. So now I can give you roughly an outline of my talk, what I will um, um, talk about. So from the previous discussion, you maybe got um, some questions um, um, that always concern this marginal problem, where you can essentially argue, argue that these um, yeah, are related to the marginal problem. Yeah, so if the first simple question is, um, if you ha have some reduced states, can I ask, is there some global state compatible with it? Yeah, and you can make the extra constraints that the state should be pure or not. I mean, this is, depends on the problem, but this is just a inference, okay, you know, have some marginals, can you find some global state that is compatible? Then, <clears throat> other, 
other thing, if you have a give, already a global state, um, you can ask, oh, is it uniquely determined by its reduced state? Yeah, and this is essentially this um, um, question that I mentioned, for instance, from the Wouters paper, um, um, where they could prove it for some sense. And this is, of course, related to the question, can I engineer my state maybe with engineering some hematome? And finally, you may look at things like um, some global properties of a um, large state, and you can ask, oh, like entanglement, for instance, and what can I say about this global properties by just looking at the marginals? Yeah, and this is somehow, uh, uh, yes, some sort of question. I mean, in my talk, I will mainly talk about two questions, um, which is um, somehow this following two. The one thing is uh, some extension of this um, um, Sudbury problem, namely, if you ask for pure states um, for this, which many marginals should be maximally mixed. So in a sense, you want to have this absolutely maximally entangled state. And um, <coughs> yes, and the question is, when can you do that? And how can you prove, find such states? And how can you maybe also find examples, proofs that they don't exist? And more generally, I will talk about this general pure state marginal problem. So this is just ask, OK, this is essentially the first question. You are given some reduced density matrices. And now is the question, is there some global pure state compatible with these marginals? OK, good. And these are essentially the main, two main parts of my talk. So let's start with the first thing. And this is about this maximally entangled states. I mean, well, these things, what I'm talking about is, um, I mean, what I mentioned before is someone like um, this, they're called absolutely maximally entangled states. Actually, I apologize a little bit for that. I, I don't like this word because absolutely maximally entangled, it sounds a little bit too fancy. But okay, people have called that, <laughs> said, so um, we just stick to the usual definitions. And <coughs> um, the um, problem is the following. So we look for n particle states. We have the um, um, uh, two body margin, where the n over two particle reduced states are maximally mixed. Um, and then, then it's uh, uh, something like a maximally entangled state with respect to any bipartition. And you can easily find some examples. Yeah, for the simplest states would be just the Bell states. I mean, this is a two body state, and of course, it's a maximally entangled state. Then you can find the jet set state, which is something like, a, um, um, but you maybe know it already. And But if you also essentially trace out um, two qubits, then from jet set state, and always one qubit remains the maximally entangled state. And that means it's maximally entangled for all bipartitions. And you can go to other states, um, which are quantum code works and some shore code, for instance, which also um, can be used, um, have this property that if I trace out some qubits, um, then, then they all make some mix. Yeah, for instance, one example would be this state. Yeah, I mean, I write them as graphs because they are graph states, but um, okay, this, I don't, I mean, you don't need to know any details about graph states for following my talk, but just see this as a nice representation of a state. And this has the property always, if you trace out three qubits, the so reducing state, the reduced state is maximally mixed, whatever you do. And yeah, so if you trace out four, four, five, and two, the so resulting state will be maximally mixed. Okay, why are these states interesting? Um, so first they correspond to a certain set of quantum codes. And that's why it's interesting because if you can prove that they exist or don't exist, you essentially prove or disprove the existence of certain quantum codes. And, and that's why it's an um, relevant thing to look at. I mean, it has been proven that if the local dimension is large enough, they exist for any n. Meaning the following. If you ask, for instance, for the four qubit absolute maximum entangled states, it doesn't exist, as mentioned before, because this was an old subparallel. Right? But if you ask for four q trits, where we have four three-level system, then it exists. And you can do the same for an arbitrary number of particles. You can say, oh, if you have 10 particles, maybe the state doesn't exist for qubits, but for q trits, q quads, go higher dimensions, whatever, it, then at some point it will exist. Um, OK, if you now focus to the special case of qubits, it's known that they exist for 2, 3, 5, and 6, which are just these examples. So, 
um, bell states, the jet set state, and these two graph states, for them exist. But um, um, for four qubits, they don't exist. This is what's the old result by um, um, Sudbury. And it's also, also known if you have more than eight qubits, they also don't exist because for this case, it's known that certain quantum codes cannot exist and that some also are. So the question is what happens for n equal to seven? And this was an open question for quite some time. Um, but finally, um, um, uh, PhD student Felix could um, solve it. And well, the result is very simple or it's very easy to formulate. It's essentially that there's no AME state for seven qubits, period. It doesn't work. And if you somehow ask him maybe for the best approximation to it, you get um, the following results, namely that you can argue that um, there is some graph state, which I write like that, where 32 of the 35 three body density matrices are maximally mixed. I mean, for being this absolutely maximally entangled state, all of them, all of the um, density matrices must be maximally mixed, and this we cannot reach. But at least you can make 32 of the 35 maximally mixed, but not more. Yeah, and in this way, it's the best approximation. Okay, how can you prove that? And I will not go into details of the proof, um, but I just want to show you the idea for the following reason. The proof in the end is surprisingly simple. Yeah, it's just a little bit of calculation with Pauli matrices. Of course, I mean, one has to try hard to find this proof, and so it's not so easy to find. I mean, it's not the thing that you come up with after one hour of thinking. But in the end, from a mathematical point of view, the techniques are rather simple. Yes, yeah, it's not like that you need some whatever C star algebras, algebraic geometry, I don't know, graph theory or other deep things in mathematics. It's just a little bit of nice calculations. And the idea is roughly as follows. If you have the state, you can decompose it into Pauli matrices. I mean, this you can always do. And you can sort the terms I'm, depending on how many body correlations you have. If you have something like one body correlations, two body correlations, and so on. And this you can sort. And this is what we want to relax. So you have the identity and you have one body correlation, two body correlations, three body correlations. This means that. Here you have two Paulis, three Paulis, or four Paulis, and the rest is identity. Then um, you can, if you would have an AME state of seven qubits, you can write some properties of this re reduced states because they have to be essentially proportional to the identity. And this gives you some relations between um, these reduced states, and also you can say that the global state is an eigenstate of its reduced state. And this just follows from the fact that this is an absolutely maximal thing state. But now you can essentially revert this and use these things and insert it in this representation. And this gives you some constraints on the Pauli matrices here that you have here. And if you then calculate a bit, you find a contradiction. Yeah, and you have to essentially only insert these inequalities into this um, um, Pauli representation and calculate a little bit, and then you find a contradiction. And yeah, that's it. And with that, you can prove that this seven qubit um, state does not exist. And that's the main point of the result. Now, if you're looking for some more general things in the sense that, okay, this was maybe just a specific example where you have a nice proof. Um, if you want to prove some more general things on this problem, then there's something which is called the range shadow inequality or shadow inequalities. I mean, what are these inequalities? And actually they're quite useful. They're not, I mean, they look horrible, but they're also not so difficult to understand. And actually also to prove them, it's not so difficult, but okay. Anyways, it's a matter of taste. So, yeah. so <clears throat> what can I type? So essentially the statement tells you the following. Let's assume that you have two positive operators, X and Y on N particles. And you look at, at a certain subset of the particles. And then you look at the following expression. You take essentially from this operator X, some trace of something, of some partial trace. You take from the operator Y, some partial trace. So these are two operators that you multiply. And then you take the trace again. And actually what is from here to here in this trace, oh, sorry, 
This is clearly positive because these are positive operators. The reduced states are positive and the, tra the trace between two positive operators is always positive. But you also allow for some alternating signs. Here, this is minus one to the power s tensor t. And the claim is that still this thing is positive. Yeah, and this, okay, one can prove it by using some, I mean, okay, if you look at the Reigns paper, the proof is a little bit abstract. I mean, it's not difficult, but somewhat abstract, but there are more direct proofs using some positive maps, for instance, um, which you can use to, to, to prove that. Anyway, and this is just an equality which you can just get, I mean, get and buy and believe and whatever. But now coming to back to this AME problem, one can do the following. Let's assume that such an AME state exists. And now I could, in this inequality, just set X and Y just to be this AME state. Then I can somewhat take this um, AME state and because it's an AME state, I know that the reduced states are essentially, or many of them are proportional to the identity. So that means I know many of these terms here because there are this reduced states where proportional to the identity. And if I can then argue that already with setting certain terms here to certain numbers, I get a contradiction and I cannot fulfill this anymore. This means that this AME state did not exist, such to say it cannot exist with these properties. And this is something of one of the more general tricks, how you can use essentially this theorem to um, rule out um, AME state. And if you do it in detail, you find the following picture. <clears throat> mm. So this is the number of particles. And this is just the, this is for, for um, practical reasons. This is just the odd cases. And these are the even, uh, this are even cases. And this is odd cases. And then you have this local dimension here. And then you can ask, oh, for which states I find a contradiction. And these are all these blue areas here. Yeah, so that means, for instance, that for four qubits, and for four, uh, for four systems and two local dimension two for four qubits, the state doesn't exist. This is the old result by Sudbury. But in principle, with this shadow inequality, you can also prove then that somehow for 20 particles and four dimensions, so 20 cube quads, the state also doesn't exist because this is somehow here blue. Yeah? And for instance, there's a seven qubit example. Um, what Felix proved this would be here. He has a seven qubit state also doesn't exist, that's why it's blue, but actually this doesn't follow from shadow inequality, that's quite interesting. But on the other hand, also for some states, for some dimension, it's known that these states exist, and that's why we we'll put this E here, that means that there it's known that they exist. And actually this table is a little bit outdated because quite recently, um, people from India and also from Poland have found uh, absolutely maximum entangled states of four, particles which are six dimension, which would be this thing here. And there should be also an E because this was proven to exist. Actually, I will come um, to this problem in a second um, later and yes, just to mention that there is. Okay, good. Are there maybe any questions so far? Because now I'm coming to the next part of my talk, but in principle, if there are questions already in between, um, feel free to ask them. I mean, I do not see the chat here, but if you just um, tell them, or maybe if the organizer sees something in the chat, please yeah, do not hesitate. Uh, exactly. I'll try. Me. Yeah, could you just elaborate a little? Sorry? Getting muted. Sorry, I could not hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So could you just please elaborate on these shadow enumerators? I mean, uh, how are they obtained? Why are they called shadow enumerators? That's a good question. Well, <laughs> I mean, OK, in principle, Reigns was interested in finding some quantum codes or essentially proving that certain quantum codes do not exist. And um, or excluding that certain quantum codes exist. And, and essentially, what, what is the quantum code in this, um, um, in this respect? Um, this is somehow like, it's, it's always something like a, you have 
maybe, I don't know, 10 qubits, and you look at a certain subspace, and in the subspace, all the, um, 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 all the states must have, for instance, vanishing two body marginals, because, I mean, they should not, I mean, if a state should not be affected by an error on a single qubit, then it's always good if the reduced state is somewhat maximally mixed. Yeah, for instance, if the, because then you can still, if, I mean, for instance, if you have a state, but the reduced state is maximally mixed on all the three qubit states or, 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 or three qubit subsets, I mean, then you can easily see what happens if an error happens and essentially says it doesn't get um, already orthogonal to the original state. Yeah. So let's put it as that. Reigns was interested in finding subspaces of an n qubit systems where all states have certain properties. And that's why, why he started essentially this business. I mean, if you just ask for the word why he calls them shadow inequalities, I think this no notion of shadows is also known from classical codes. But I must personally say that I'm not an expert on this. Okay, thanks. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. yeah. so, 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 um, um, yes. Okay, further questions. Okay, good. I mean, you can also ask me later. Then I come maybe to the second part of the talk. And this is a little bit more general. Well, it's a general problem, but in the end, um, we come back to the old problem of this AME states. We can, yeah, essentially come back to the problem and can reformulate it. Unfortunately, this reformulation also is, is very nice, this reformulation. Um, unfortunately, yeah, it's still difficult, but okay. Let's go step by step. Okay, so now we're looking at this general marginal problem. And <clears throat> what is this general marginal problem? So we're asking, do we find some pure n-particle state which has a set of given marginals? Yeah. So let's assume that we know that for this pure, pure n-particle states that certain reduced states, if we trace out something, it should give some states, which are given as a set. And um, yes, and then the question is just simple. Oh, can you write down a global state that has this property? And in principle, the first observation, okay, it's probably as, as the second observation here is, um, is that of course, this is essentially a generalization of this AME problem. Because in this AME problem, I asked for something like a, for instance, a seven qubit state, where certain reduced states are maximally mixed or proportional to the identity. Yeah, but here I'm just now allowing arbitrary um, um, states. Yeah, which are just given to me. So in principle, this AME problem is just a special instance of that. Um, also, you may ask, okay, well, now let's depend a little bit on which sets do I know my margins. Let's, as for instance, assume that I know only the single, single particle margins. Yeah, so once here, let's assume here that I have my four particle state. Yeah, and let's assume that I know this trace, that this trace is row A, this is row B, this is row C, this is row D. And then just know the single qubit reduced marginals and not the two body reduced marginals. So I do not know row B, C or whatever. I just row A, row B, row C, row D. Then actually, these marginals that are, that are given here, they are not overlapping. Yeah, because I just have four separate marginals. And then it's also easy to see because then everything under, um, I can choose, I can diagonalize these guys by, lo by local unitaries, which means that in this case, only the eigenvalues of row A, row B, row C, and row D play a role. And because I can always, without losing generality, choose them to be diagonal, and then in a suitable basis, and then construct the state in this basis. And actually, I should stress for this case, um, a solution is known, which is due to Kliashko, already it's quite some time ago, um, which essentially gives you this, the answer to this result um, if you just have non-overlapping margins and just send the eigenvalues. And then you can find some um, um, conditions on the eigenvalues. And, but this actually, if you look at the paper, it heavily relies on algebraic geometry. So it's not so straightforward to apply. Yeah, but in principle, I should say that this thing is known. 
Okay, but now we are just not considering it's a CVF. Non-overlapping marginals, we have more general marginals, like in this AME problem, where we have really overlapping marginals. Okay, how can we formulate this problem? Well, first, I mean, we have our condition, and we just look at all states that are compatible with that. Meaning, we look at all density matrices which have the property that have the marginals as we want them to have, want them to be. And this is a set of mixed states. Actually, it might be empty, yeah. But um, now the question whether we find a pure state compatible with these marginals can be rephrased because we can say, oh, we just ask, we look at the set, and we ask, oh, does this set contain a pure state? Because the question whether this set contains a pure state is equivalent to the question whether um, this marginal problem here has a solution because we're just looking for pure states that are compatible. Good. Next step, how can we test something where there's a pure state in it? Actually, testing for something for purity is actually ugly because purity is something like a nonlinear function of the state. So the trick to, to go no beyond that is just to go to two copies in the following sense. I can just essentially take, have this set and just take two copies of these guys. And um, um, so I take essentially well, two times the same state and take essentially this convex hull, which means that I take essentially with some probabilities um, states of this form. And this now gives me essentially a two copy system. So I have first my one end body system, which is just my original problem, and I take a second copy. And I ask for something like this convex hull in this high space. Obviously, all these states here are separable I mean, by definition, yeah, because I mean this is a separable state. Yeah, so this is not this is not a problem. Okay, but the point is now in this set, I can easily or more easily check for the existence of pure states. How do I do that? I mean, there's a famous trick with a flip operator. Which is actually, I don't know. Well, it's a standard trick always appearing out of the blue in, in, in several instances. It's just the following thing that if you have the flip operator and takes the flip operator row A tends to row B, then it's just essentially the trace of row A times row B. Yeah, I mean, this trick has been used many times. And um, yes, so this is um, something that's not so new. But what does, what does it mean? <laughs> if I now take a state out of my two copy space and I take the trace a flip operator of this state, then, I mean, let, let's just go up. This is two copy space was given by these states. Now I take the flip operator, I can put it into the sin. And then I get, because of this rule, I get just trace row k squared. And this is smaller than one. Yeah, because I mean, these things are smaller than one, the sum of PK is as this is no probability, which is always smaller or equal to one. But if there is a pure state in this set C, so if there is a set goes up again, if the set C is a pure state like a psi, then in this C2, there's also the state psi tends of psi. And then you would get here something that could trace psi, which is equal to one. So that means that here you can say, okay, if there's a pure state here, then I can find in my set C2 some state where the expectation value of the flip operator is exactly equal to one. And now we are more or less already done, well, nearly done, because now we can try to formulate the quest for a pure state in the set C as something like a uh, maximization of, a, of something with the flip operator. And we look, ask, can it be one or not? So this is the first main result <clears throat> that we can say the following. If, so we look, want to solve this marginal problem on these n particles. And we define some of our compatibility um, space here with the marginals. And then we look at two copies of this. And now um, the statement is that we can solve this marginal problem if 
and only if the result of this optimization is equal to one. And the so optimization is just the following. We take the expectation value of the flip operator with, our, with a set of states. The states have, should be separable and normalized. OK, that's more than trivial. But yes, it's because all the state in the, state in the set C2 was, was separable. And um, in addition, this phi, of course, should obey the constraints of um, the marginals, that we want to have certain marginal stops. And now what you get here, and what, what is the nice thing, is that this is the kind of optimization problem which you can tackle with, well, not with standard methods, but with methods that you may know, or let's put it that, that who are on the market in the following sense. Um, before, that was, it was just an existence problem. Yeah, we had said, oh, um, well, does there exist a pure global state with these and these properties? And the statement was, and this is so such an existence problem is more difficult to solve. Then here, just saying, look, we have a maximization under some constraints, and you just ask, is this one or not? And if you see now, the trick is okay. There's still the separability constraint, and separ the separable states are not so easy to characterize. Or um, um, yes, but um, yes, but there's still now some approximations in the following sense. <coughs> okay, so first, I mean, if this trace that you want to optimize is equal to one, then this phi actually has to act on the symmetric subspace only, which means that here we can restrict without losing generality to symmetric separable states. And if we restrict our case to symmetric separable states, this reduces the dimension quite a lot. Yeah. Then for the separability problem, I mean, there are some results known um, which essentially go to more copies. And then you can solve it by something with a sequence of semi-definite programs. In the following sense, if you have a separable state, then it's known, well, first, if you have a separable state, then you can easily write down something like some extension where you just have two copies of Bob. Yeah, this is easily possible. And then you can ask, oh, is there some two copy extension of Bob? And um, this you can ask by some semi-definite program. And this is a test for separability. And it's known essentially if you go for more and more copies of Bob, then this is complete in the sense that you can only find all extensions if and of only if the state is separate. OK, but these are known results. So we can extend it now. So essentially, we can write down this um, problem of finding this, um, uh, this pure state with a given marginals as some hierarchy of um, um, semi-definite programs, where we get, always get take more and more copies. So first, we had this two copy thing. And then we can go more and more copies. And we're always looking for n copies. We're looking essentially for some symmetric um, state, which is positive, normalized, and um, has a property that it gives essentially the marginals. And this is a sequence of semi definite programs. And this is equivalent to this original marginal problem. So in this sense, you can say you have solved this pure state marginal problem because um, essentially can give a test of semi-definite programs and they get better and better and each state, I mean, each instance can be decided after a finite number of steps. Yeah, of course, it might be still difficult because the dimension is high, but in some theoretical sense, we can say, oh, we solved it. Okay, now, because I want to come back um, a little bit to the AME problem, shortly, some things about symmetries, namely, you can often um, simplified. I mean, here we were looking at for some quantum states with a bunch of properties. And also here, essentially, already here, we can say, wait, here, we were essentially looking for quantum states with a bunch of properties. But if we know a little bit more about our problem, we can often uh, restrict our attention to a, to a smaller family of quantum states. For instance, 
I mean, we can easily prove that if somehow these margins obey some symmetry, then the state also has to have some symmetries. And if you apply to the ME problem, there is something like you can say, oh, first, the ME states have the, pro the properties that the under if you permute them, they still stay, become stay ME states. And they also stay absolutely maximum entangled if you make local unitaries. I mean, these are quite trivial things because somehow this is uh, absolute maximum entangled states. Yeah? But these two things give you some constraints on the states that you're looking at, to look at. And in the end, it turns out that there's only one state left. Yeah, what can then really prove that an E state exists if and only if an explicitly given operator phi B is a separable state with respect to some bipartition. Yeah, and we can explicitly calculate it. I will give you an example in a second. But this is some of the best you can achieve. That you can say, look, the question whether some absolutely maximum maintained states is, is just completely equivalent to the separability problem of some bipartite state. And um, then, of course, you can look for what is the first thing that you do? Oh, well, you can just say, look, and look at these states and ask, do they violate the PPT criterion? And if they violate the PPT criterion, you know that this AME state cannot exist. And if you do that, I mean, you can just, it's a very simple calculation with a computer program. Um, then you directly see that more or less all the states or the results that will exist in about non existence of AME states, you recover. Okay, it's just that the state that you have here is already violates the PPT criterion, so it's obviously entangled and Period, you're done. Yeah, apart from one thing, the seven qubit case, which I discussed before, this you, this you cannot solve in this manner. I mean, all the other things are solved. But then you can um, go on and maybe look at the state a bit. And of course, these states look a little bit horrible. Um, but this was one example. This was nice because we spent um, quite a lot of time to solve it. But in the end, we failed. Namely, I told you about this question about this. AME states of four particles of six dimensions. And this corresponds to some state where Alice and Bob have four six dimensional systems. And you can write down some state. And this state is separable if and only if this AME state exists. And this was a nice question because, I mean, there was a, a paper um, where this was called one of the five selected open problems in quantum information theory. And of course, we spent some weeks or months to trying to solve it, and we failed. Um, we always believed that this state was entangled and wanted to prove that this MEC does not exist. But OK, what then turned out to be, this was this paper, what I mentioned before, that this somehow um, um, exists. So this state is separable. And this essentially gave them two, 2,022 euros, which was a prize for this, one of the solving one of this problem. But in principle, if you're interested, I mean, you can also look at other examples. This would be the case for the seven qubit um, case. And this state must be entangled because this AME state doesn't exist. But honestly, honestly, I have no um, idea how to prove that this is entangled directly from the state. I mean, we tried a bunch of separability criteria and all of them failed. OK, let me come to my conclusion. Um, so I talked in the beginning, I talked a little bit about AME states. And I um, showed you that sometimes they don't exist. And this is related to quantum codes. It's on. Um, then I talked a little bit about this general pure state marginal problem and I showed you how this can be solved with some hierarchy of semi definite programs. And finally, I talked a little bit about that this AME state problem can be really seen as equivalent to a specific separability. OK, so in principle, if you want to look for literature, these are maybe the two main papers where you find um, the things that I um, explained to you. And um, yes, this is um, our group here in Z. And OK, this is um, Chao, who worked out a lot. Actually, the other um, people from the talk are essentially not on this picture. I apologize for that. But they um, just left recently. And this is quite a recent picture. But yes, so this is for more or less everything I want to tell you and thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you, Artfred, so much for this uh, very nice talk, very beautiful talk.
So now this is open for questions. And uh, if you want, you can write down your question in the chat box, or you could also unmute yourself and ask it. So any questions? No, it is so in the time we have some questions, let me go back to uh, this, uh, your uh, AME problem. And uh, so this yes. is, this may not be exactly related to, I mean, the, the heart of your present talk, but a couple of years ago, you also wrote another very interesting paper regarding this uh, entanglement detection using some marginals of a partially transposed uh, density matrix. So is it in any way related to this uh, AME problem or do you, do you have any connections to that? Um... Well, partly yes, partly no. <laughs> yeah, if you would I mean, rather elaborate, yeah, yes, yes. I mean, the, the point is the following. In this entanglement detection, you typically um, do not want to um, um, assume that the global state is pure. Because um, this is somehow, I mean, if, if, if you have an experiment and look at the two-body marginals, um, I, mean, you, I mean, it's not somehow, not very, um, how shall I formulate? Not very serious to assume that your um, global state that you have is pure um, because an experiment is never pure. Yeah. So, in, in, in this way, it's, I mean, in, in all this AME state business, it's usually assume it to be pure. So, that's why it's um, maybe not so related. Um, um, on the other hand, I think, of course, from spirit, it's quite similar. Yeah. Because, I mean, you have some constraints on the margins. You want to say something about the global state. Yeah, and um, yes. Yeah, so the thinking was on the in the similar direction, but I think the mathematics and framework is rather uh, different for this. Yeah, I mean, wait, I mean, of, of course, I mean, one thing, of course, which <laughs> which is from the framework, um, and similar in both things, that you often do use a lot of semi-definite programs, <laughs> because I mean, you you always end. I mean, we did this entanglement detection where we essentially looked for some PPT like criteria for general multi-part entanglement and so on. And um, yes, for that, you essentially always need some different programs. And this, that's why it's um, um, quite similar. Yeah, the other thing I, I asked, actually, I interrupted you in the middle of your talk and asked about these shadow detection. So in that paper, I remember, I mean, those marginals were detected through shadow tomography. So are these two shadows connected in any way? I mean, the... Ah. <laughs> Ah, you mean, ah, yeah. actually, that's, wait, that's a funny question, yes. So you, you're asking whether um, shadow inequalities and shadow tomography are somewhat related. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, okay, actually, <laughs> actually, the, I had the same, um, um, when I, when just, when I talked just some minutes ago about it, I said, oh, yes, but I think it's there not. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, yeah, funny use of the English uh, language in this. Actually, I mean yes. Actually, I, maybe I, I should add something to the shadow um, inequalities, um, which I didn't say. Because in principle, what I only presented you is the shadow inequality in the simplest case, which is acting essentially on two copies. Because if you, if you look what I have here, wait, I said let me just scroll up. So yeah, where was it here? Essentially, I'm inserting here only two operators, yeah, and some of this is in, in the end something like a quadratic inequality. Actually, if you look at the original paper by Reigns, um, he also has higher order shadow inequality where you have three copies, four copies, and so on. Okay. Um, but to be honest, um, I mean. I never really um, understood, or I never saw it how to how one can use them explicitly. For instance, for this AME problem. Yeah, in principle, I mean this. I just want to say that this is just the simplest shadow inequality, and they are much more complicated and higher order ones. But they are actually very difficult to grasp and to get some of what is the intuition behind them. Yeah, and this is maybe just an add to your also to your last question that you had during the talk. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Are there any other questions? Uh, if not, let us once again thank uh, the speaker.
Professor Oppai Duene for this wonderful talk and for sparing his time to agree to give this talk in, at this meeting here. And I'm sure if there are some questions from students, you can write me an email and perhaps uh, you may find the time to answer them. So thank you. Yes, Oppai, contact me by email. I'm always happy. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur, and thank you, Professor Duene. Okay, thank you very much for this nice opportunity, for the invitation. Thank you. Bye-bye.